today, we're going to be talking about conflict. This couple, they dated, and, and, and then they got, they got married. Book of uh, Songs of Solomon, chapter 3, they got married. Chapter 4, we dealt with their sex life, honeymoon life. And now, chapter 5 and 6, they begin to get into conflict. Every relationship will have a conflict. We can't escape the conflict. You know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, I have a perfect marriage. You know, after 30 years later, they say, I have a perfect marriage. But they would not tell you what they went through to become that perfect marriage. So it's important for us to know that every relationship will have a conflict. And I'm going to teach you today how to fight right. Because there's going to be a fight, and the fight needs to be fight in, in a way that God created uh, according to Scripture. So. So I'm going to jump in this, um, uh, my thesis scripture that I've been working on all this uh, series. If, if you miss anything, and I want our church to become like this scripture. I want our church to be kind of this uh, uh, scripture, the Songs of Solomon chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. I'm going to read this um, and this is the DNA of this entire series. You know, at the end of the series, if, if I can accomplish this one scripture in you, in me, in all of us, and we have done such a marvelous work here at CJC Life. So Solomon says, Solomon's songs of Solomon says, by the way, Solomon wrote almost thousand plus songs. These eight of them are the best of the best of Songs of Solomon. So you, you, you read the uh, book of Kings and you will know there so, uh, Solomon wrote so many songs, but they co consolidated the best of them of all his thousand of them. So he says, let me kiss the, the in this uh, Songs of Solomon, the three characters will be talking. Number one, Jesus takes care of yesterday. And now he's going to give us a brand new slate, a paper, brand new paper with the pen to you that, so that you can write from here for your future. So it's important for us to know what the Word of God says. Then we can apply that in our life. Then we can be walking in that kind of joy, peace. And also other people can also celebrate our life as God is leading us. So don't feel condemned. Don't elbow your neighbor. And don't feel like, man, I wish my husband would be here. I wish my wife should be here. But don't just listen to for yourself and learn something today and apply to your life. And it's going to be a really blessing to you. And I, I, I believe that God is going to bring something in your heart and see what, what, what's going to happen to your heart. So uh, if you look at the scripture, in this scripture, she's sleeping, and uh, she's just laying down. She's tired. End of the day, you know, she's, uh, she's done she's working all day, take care of him. But she said, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me. And, and you know, she was laying inside the house, and probably Solomon went to play soccer with the men, fishing or working late that night, you know, he probably came late that night, you know, she's staying there, and she could, she's laying down on bed, she's probably tired, she said, my lover is knocking, and he's knocking at the door, he's saying, open to me, my sweet, my darling, my dove, my flawless one, he's like, my honey bun, please open, he's been nice to, you know, when you're tired, you just come home, you don't, you don't want to deal with nothing, you just, sweetie, just, just let me in, you know, let me, let me lay my head down, and my head is drenched with the dew, and you know that we all men can connect with men, and I, you know, sometimes you are, you're having a long day, you come home, your wife wants to know how is your day, you're like, I'm just tired, <laughs> You know, just, just let me sleep. But, but here in this, in this story that she is not opening up the door because she's mad. You can tell her she's mad. She doesn't want to open the door because he did not come right time to his, her, uh, her house. So he just, she just locked the door. And it goes on to say, and, uh, you know, he says, my hair uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the da uh, dampness of the night. And now she's saying here, I have taken off my robe, and must I put it on again? I have washed my feet, must I soil them again? And in other words, in a Hebrew language, she's telling, I have a headache. <laughs> just leave me alone, you know. <laughs> Some of you are like, what is that sense? You know, just leave me alone. I'm, I don't want to open the door. And he's out there knocking on the door. Open the door, honey bun. Sweet pie, I'm just tired. Let me come in. But there's, you can see there's a conflict began in the chapter already. 
They dated right. They got married. They had a honeymoon. They had all night, Richie Long song going on. Everything just went well. Now, they came in their relationship. Conflict began. Now, you know, man wants to stay late, working late, or doing whatever he's got to do for the family. And woman says, no, I'm not going to get up. I don't want to put on my, my dress back again to open the door. And if you look at here, the next verse, it says, my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. And some of the scholars said he literally, he did not literally do that. He trying to threaten her to open the door by force to express his, his energy or anger, frustration. And some scholars believe he literally knocked the door off because he was done for the day, because he was mad. It just opened the door, woman. Um, it's like he's cold out there. The dew is on it. But how, whatever the reason, I believe that he literally opened the door by force because he's expressing, you know, frustration. And the the the, the wife says here, my heart began to pound for him. I rose to open. So now finally she decided, well, I'm going to open the door. When she rose up to open the door, my lover, my hands are dripped with the mire, my fingers with the, with the flowing mire. And that tells us she's just like, you know, end of the day, puts all her oil. She's ready to go to bed. And she opened it. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He's gone, my heart sank at his departure. Now you see the story that she's opened the door, now he's gone. He tried and he tried, I'm out of here. I'll go find another hotel or something, I don't know. Just, I don't know, he's gone. He's, now she's, when she's ready to open the door, he's not there. He's, he's completely drunk. So I want to just kind of, you know, uh, let you know that every couple will go through conflict. Every couple. I go through conflict. Me and my wife go through conflict. We fight. And sometimes my wife says, you fight like a sprinkler. You know, but I, whatever, I fight. I just, because we, we, all of us have a difference. We fight. Any, every marriage will, will have a fight. But I learned by the word of God, there is a way to fight right. And I'm going to teach you today. It's going to help you men, women, to fight according to God's word. You know, the goal is to not to fight. The goal is you're going to have a fight whether you agree or not. Whether I, it doesn't matter how much you're going to believe that your own life and about your spouse is so good, she's so nice. You will have a conflict. You will have a conflict. You take my notes. I mean, like if you got, just got married... You know, you'll have a conflict, just let you know. So I want to train you into a concept that I want you to buy into. That way God can start working in you to help you to see there is a blessing in conflict. Every fight will bring some sort of future. Every fight will create something that God is understanding. God is going to open the way, especially if you understand the faces in relationships. So I found the three faces in a marriage relationship, and this will work in any relationship, but especially in marriage relationships. Phase one is a honeymoon phase. I was doing a study on this word honeymoon. It's kind of like a honeymoon. It's like a, you know, sweet month. In other words, it's good for a month. Honey is a sweet. Moon is 29.5 days. It's a moon month. It's one month is good. So in other words, one month she looks perfect to you. One month he looks awesome to you. One month she smells good to you. One month he smells awesome to you. It's like, you're like, la 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 la, so awesome. My marriage is so perfect. If somebody comes and knock on your door on 22nd day, you say, oh, my marriage is perfect. Because you're still in honeymoon season, so you don't know what's going to happen after the honeymoon. So 30-day cycle is gone by. You know, you're going to recognize something so awesome that you realize that you married a Beyonce and you discover Saddam Hussein. <laughs> and you thought, wow, I married somebody so wonderful, you know, Tom Cruise, and I discovered Lady Gaga, you know. But I don't know. So you, you all going to find out the difference, like after honeymoon later, how come you did not tell me you were this? How come you did not tell me you smoked this? How come you did not tell me you do this? All this begin to come out, and that's the person you're going to live with the rest of your life. And then the conflict begins. Now you have this, this second phase that you transition. I call disillusionment. In other words, illusionment, we know that we, we marry somebody and we begin to imagine somebody else. 
You know, we think like, man, if I would have married so-and-so, I think my life would be better. <laughs> you know, how many people think after we got married, I should have married that person? No, you shouldn't. You married the right person. Stick to that person because it's just the illusion, man. You know, sometimes the, it's a feeling of disappointment. You feel like, man, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in this marriage. The results is not like what I expected. It's, it's illusion. Do you know, many of the couple don't make this second phase. This is where the divorce happens. Because the honeymoon season is over. Now you come into the disillusionment and it's, it's just kind of, you know, you're, you're looking something, you know. In, in other words, like you, you, you're, you're saying, I find out something about you you did not tell me. I find out something about you. You never disclosed me. We never talked about before the marriage. We never, you never said you, you, you do your bank account this way. You never said you use this credit card secretly. You never said this. All this mess will come in front of you. Now you're, you're going into a phase number two. And if you know how to fight in this phase Second phase, which is disillusionment phase. Now then you can go into the third phase, which is my favorite pay, phase. And that phase is a commitment phase. Because our couples need to go to those three phases and come to a commitment phase. Do you know the marriage will succeed only when you arrive to the commitment phase? Because marriage is not a feeling, like we all know that. You know, if, I, if I follow my feeling, I would be in jail by now. If I follow my feeling, my wife would have been gone a long time ago. If I follow my feeling, you all know that. Don't look at me like I'm a crazy guy. But, you know, when we follow our feeling, we make a mess. Can I hear an amen for that, right? Yes, we make a mess. But God gave us a choice. So when we follow the choice, the feeling will come and attach to the choice. Feelings will come and go, but the choice remain forever. Whatever you make a decision in your heart, this is the person that I'm going to live rest of my life. Hell or high water come my way, but I'm going to go through this with my life, with my God, and I'm going to make my commitment. It's the same thing. Let's give the Lord hand clap. It's the same thing. Same thing, your relationship with God. You know, sometimes we, we, we got saved in emotionally, and then you, there's no commitment to God. So we got to be saved in a commitment level, not in a honeymoon level. When you get saved, you get, yeah, I'm so Christian, I'm so excited. Oh, that's awesome, man, God is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And afterwards, bam, God broke down. You're like, I don't know what God allowed this thing. I, I thought God is so good. Yeah, he is good, but you don't see it. The honeymoon season is over. Now, disillusionment came. You thought God would do this. He did not do that. And now you automatically put him in the box like, God, how come you did this? And God is leading you into the commitment phase of relationship. When we come to the commitment phase of relationship, Bible says like this in book of Romans, all things work together for good to those who love God. Come on, let's give the Lord. Now you are committed. You're coming, to, it doesn't matter whether it's working or not. It doesn't matter what's going wrong, what's, what's, what's going right. But you're committed to God. And God says, even though you made a mistake, I'll take that mistake. I will make you somebody that your family will be surprised. Even though you made a mess, I will bring a blessing out of a mess because you committed to me. That commitment will open something that you never tapped into. And God will bring on your life. And that works, people. It really works. So... You know, those are three that I find that out in my personal life, in my matter life, in my relationship with God. I went through all those three. Honeymoon time I went through with the Lord, and disillusionment, and then commitment. But because from this scriptures, chapter 5 and chapter 6, because this couple become a model couple for all of us today. And this couple, they become one that every one of us would want to follow them. This couple fight, they fight their fight a very wonderful way. It really surprised me. I learned personally from this couple, you know, because we're going to see as we, as we progress in this uh, sermon that you're going to see how they fight. They fight it very wonderful. They fought in a way that everybody in this room wanted to follow their protocol. The reason why they were able to settle the matter the fight that they went through is because they made a commitment to each other. She made a commitment to him 
Solomon made a commitment to her. They made a commitment to each other. So they are already settled in their heart that we're going to go through this thing. We're going to fight through this thing. We're going to come out strong. So I want you to know, choices lead, feelings follow. You make choice today. You know, it's easy to divorce. It's easy to walk away. It's easy to end a relationship. But it requires faith to fight through relationship and bring a blessing. Do you know, at the end of these two chapters, the entire world celebrated this couple. They looked at them. They said, we thought you're going to do exactly like everybody else would do. But we are amazingly surprised how you guys made a good choice. And they clapped. They celebrated. The world watching us, people of God. The people are watching us, people of God. So they celebrated the choices they did. So me, as a, as a pastor, we have a staff. As a husband to my wife, Diana, I made some things, you know, pre-fight decisions. Before I fight, I have some things. Even in dictionary, I, I turn two uh, words off of my dictionary. You know, I have my dictionary. I strike it down. I remove them. I don't like those two words. Word number one is impossible. I don't like that word impossible in dictionary because God said every possible, every impossible, he make it possible. So I believe in God. There is no impossible. God will make it possible. So I turned that out. Second word I removed was divorce. I removed divorce because divorce is not God's dictionary. Yes, he said it in the Bible, but from the beginning, the Lord wants us to be united. The Lord wants us to be connected. Yeah, we all go through that. Like I said, when you look at God's standard, you're going to judge yourself. Man, yes, I went through divorce, pastor. I'm, I'm so guilty. Now, I want to encourage you. This is not for you to look back your past. This is for you to look forward for your future. You know, God took care of your past. Jesus paid price for you. He, he got to control your past. But now he's giving you a new opportunity for us to go forward so that we can do better for our people, our children, you know, so it's important for us to know that. So there are three pre-fight decisions that I want to teach you based on the scripture that I'm going to, I'm going to let you see it. So before I'm going to get into that, I want you to know that you're listening for yourself, not for your spouse and take care that you're not, you're not allowing any guilty to tell you, man, I should have done this. I didn't do it. Guess what? I failed. I felt as a pastor, for a pastor, you know, I, I really uh, said something to my wife I shouldn't be saying, and I, we all make mistakes. But thank God for the scriptures that God leads us right direction, right? God leads the righteous to go right direction. So that's what we're going to depend on God. So another thing that I want you to know, whatever I'm going to show these three decisions that they made, pre-fight decisions, it's not possible for everybody. It's only possible for people of God. And I'll tell you why. Because we need the power of God to do certain things as a godly people. And I believe that God will give us supernatural power to make this decision. Take these steps so that we can walk in it. And people will watch you and they think, man, how did you do that? Because the power of God is working in us, enabling us to do. And let's celebrate God that God gives us the power to work this married life, according to God, is calling us. Amen? Amen. So let's jump into chapter 6. You know, you do know chapter 5, I left it off the words where, where we were reading. Right after that, she was looking in the streets for her husband. Do you know when the watchmen, the friends found her, they abused her, which is the sign of demonic oppression when you're not covered by your husband. Your husband is your spiritual covering. I don't have time to elaborate on that, but if you don't have a husband, you need to make a God as your husband. It's a Lord, I trust you. You're my covering. You know, we all need a covering. So can somebody hear amen, amen? Yeah, we all need a covering. So if you're a single mother, you know, cover yourself with your friends or family members, the older ones and tell them, hey, pray for me. Keep me in prayer. And you ask God, God, you are my husband. You are my covering. You are my beloved. So this woman's covering was Solomon. And when she locked the door and she, when, when he's trying to get in, she would not open the door. And the, and, and the watchman trying to guard her and really, you know, uh, threatening her. But you know what she did in the middle of the fight? She did awesome thing. She did not complain her husband. 
And this is, the, this is the lesson that I want to teach you. It's impossible for you to think good things in the middle of the conflict. It's very impossible. But when the power of God is working in us, then you can think good things about your spouse. You know, as soon as you get mad, you're so mad at the person because he did this, this, this. But during that time, imagine if you're counting good good things about that person. Man, my husband did this. My husband be like that. My husband used to do this way. And you counting all the blessings out of it, it prepare her heart to look for him in a good manner. And that's found in that chapter. When you read the chapter, he said, she said, my, my lover is gorgeous. My lover is handsome. My lover is in the middle of the fight, in the middle of the conflict. She's meditating who he was when she met him. So it's important for us to follow this. So here, chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Where has your lover gone, most beautiful woman? So the friends are asking now to this young lady who's married to Solomon. So where is your lover? You've been looking for him. Did you find him? Where is your lover? Which way did your lover turn that we may look for him with you? My lover has gone down to his garden. So she's now telling to the friends or the daughters of Jerusalem, she said, my lover has gone down to his garden. And she gets on and say, to the beds of the spices, to browse in the gardens and to, to gather lilies. I am my lover's and my lover is mine. He, he browsed among the lilies. Can you believe that? In the middle of the fight, she even confessing, he's mine, I am his, he's somewhere. But she learned about this man so much that I know where my husband is right now. And the vision came to her because she's confessing good things about our husband, especially wives. As soon as your husband does something wrong, you immediately talk about it in your mind. You may not going to say it out loud. You're like, you stupid. Yeah, should have been there. Uh, you might not. You should have been done. You shouldn't be doing that. Look at that. That you hang that thing off. That's so dumb. You know. So you you're just talking about him. I was too. But you gotta start learning confessing. You know, my love. You're 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 godly man. I know. I married a man. He's good. He's godly. He's handsome. He's he's as she's adoring him. The vision opened to her. She saw where he was, and and then he, she she said this. My lover is in the garden. To gather lilies. He's not, he's not there gathering lilies for, for his wife. You know, even though he is, you know. He's not there like smelling those lilies. No, he's there gathering lilies. I am my lover's. My love is mine. He browses among the lilies. So what, is the, what was he doing there? Solomon, in the middle of the fight, he walked away from his wife. And he went to this valley of lilies. And the, 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 the place where there's a mire, or there's a spices. And I call this because he was, he was changing his focus instead of being angry at her, instead of like a talking, thinking about her, why she did not open the door, why she's so rude to me, why she cannot even, even accept me to open the door. Instead of thinking about her negative, he, he departed from her and find a place where he could seek God. So in Lilies, what he's doing, he's like a collecting his heart. He's collecting his emotions. He's collecting like, you know one thing, I'm not going to focus on her, what she did. I'm going to focus on why these emotions are getting over me. So I'm going to chill out. So what he did, he find a place where he can rest well. So in Lilies, when you see flowers, you always have that, that kind of a fragrance, kind of it smells good, looks good. Everybody will have a little smile on faces when you see flowers because he's looking at that. He was, he was gazing at his heart. He was seeing like, Lord, I don't want to walk into my emotion. I want to walk in my choice. I'm just going to seek you, God. I'm just going to depend on you. So he's allowing the power of God work on him as he's departing from the fight. And I call this, I will act, not react. That's the phase number one. In the middle of the fight, my friends, we need to learn to act, not react. We were taught to react. You know, we'll say this way. You, you know, your wife says something, you write back at, no, you this. No, you did not do that. No, you did not do that. What about last year? No, what about last before year? You're like uh, reacting to each other emotions, fighting at each other, pulling down each other, calling names at each other. Some of us even call curse words at each other. We're tearing God's temples with the words. Words are powerful. 
You can kill people with the words. You don't need a knife. You can kill people inside out words. So as a people of God, God's power is going to work in us. We're inviting God. Now we got to learn to do what God is telling us to do. Like Solomon chose to do right thing. He acted, not reacting to the situation. He walked away from it. Find a place where so he can really rest well and seek into his heart to find out why I'm emotionally led today. Why I'm emotionally drawn today. Not reaction. You know, I want you to know that it's, it's easy to judge other people. Oh, well, okay, let me say it again. It's easy to judge other people. Have you ever asked yourself, who called you a judge? It's easy to judge me judging somebody else. We can judge anybody. I can judge my wife. I can judge so-and-so. I can judge anybody. It's easy. But it requires faith not to judge other people. It requires a character not to judge other people. It requires an act not to judge other people. You know, you know it's, it's kind of like the story that I, I heard that there's a couple, they were so silent. They, were, they both were fought all day. They don't want to talk to each other. So the husband, he has to get up next day morning. He has to go early, early morning to catch a flight, 4 o'clock flight, a 5 o'clock flight. So he wrote a slip because he's not talking to her. They both had a fight. They had a, they had a fist-to-fist argument. So he wrote a slip and left her on her pillow and he says, tomorrow I have a flight at 5, 5 a.m. Wake me up. And he, they slept. No, nobody talked. They backs to each other. They slept. And he woke up 9 o'clock. He's, he, he missed his flight. Now he's so mad, walking in the room looking for her and he came back to bedroom looking at his pillow. It says on the slip, it is 5 o'clock. Wake up. <laughs> so we sometimes... We sometimes walk in that kind of communication, you know, and the guy missed the flight, you know how it went. (laughs) But it's important for us to live according to God's standard. We cannot be judging, especially husband and wife. We need to be one. I strive my best to be united with my wife. Every area of my life, I labor for that. I used to not to labor for that. I thought it's going to happen. It never happened. I had to work it out, right? Somebody say amen for that. I got to work it out. Your marriage is working out. And look at even Jesus himself acted, not reacted. And when I read this scripture, I, I speak to myself, Lord, I want to be like this scripture. I want to live a life of this scripture. First. Peter 2, 23, I found this, and I was reading it. It really ministered to my heart. And no wonder why Solomon was led by the Spirit of God, and he did as Jesus would do. When they hurled their insult at him, and we know how Jesus died for all of us. They hurled inside him, inside at him, and he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself To him who judges justly. I encourage you, my friend, take that principle. Do not judge anybody. Do not not make any threats. You know, as a husband and a wife, we threat each other. We threat, no, you do that. I'm going to expose this. How come you can do this? You know, it's a threat going on in our marriages. We need to stop that. We need to put that as we're godly people. We have God inside of our work in us. We need to act, we need not to react. We need to act like a God. When he was suffered, he had a voice to voice it out. Do you know Jesus said, I can call a legion of angels to come down. Yes, let me give you a mathematical equation. One angel destroyed 180,000 soldiers, Assyrian soldiers, one angel. Can you believe how much damage could those 12,000 angels do? And Jesus said, I can call 12,000 angels right now. But he chose not to. He made a choice. He did not go with emotion. He did not go with the feeling. So I want to encourage you if you're married, use your words carefully. Yes, you made a damage to your relationship. Let's start right today. Let's give a new beginning to our marriage. Let's use the words that are intentional, meaningful, not to threats, not to judge, but lift somebody in our marriage. Can we do that? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. I know you're going to do that. As a pastor, that's my job, to lead the church so that we all can live according to God's standard. Look at Romans chapter 12, 21 says. It's easy 
for us to be, you know, moved away from being good. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Good always empowers evil. Good has a power more than evil. Good will always prevail at the end. If you look at book of uh, uh, Revelations, at the end, we win. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. That's the, that's the story. We win. It doesn't matter how, how bad it is right now, how ISIS is doing right now, how the terrorism is going right now. The end of the story is Jesus is the Alpha. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the first and the last. He has the power to end everything like he said. Bible says God is good. He does not have a evil. So you and I can walk in good, be in good, act in good, judge in good, speak in good, sing in good, declare in good. Because we're the people of God. Goodness of God is working in us. We can walk in good and be a good people so that God can revive all of us. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand to us. So do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if, if you're here, if you're asking me, so Philip, how do I do that? I learned two principles. Let me give you the principle. Woman needs to be loved. Man, love your wife. Love them unconditionally. Love them according to their own love tank. Show them that love. Woman, man needs respect. Respect your husband. In spite of what he did. In spite of what he is, respect him. So men likes to be respected. Women likes to be loved. And if you still want to go, bring your spouse to one of our marriage small groups. Every Saturday, we have 10 a.m. We're completely focusing on marriages in this church. We're, we're a fresh church, new church. There's so many couples coming on. We want to make sure our marriages are led by the Spirit of God. So if you need help, we have a brother, Greg and Isabel. They're leading a great uh, small group for marriage. Go to the, there's a book that they're doing, Five Languages for a Couple. It's a great book. Put your couple into that. And if you're one of those couples that are going through rough edges right now, I encourage you as a pastor, be part of the small group. You watch, next 12 weeks, God will transform your marriage into a place where you never dreamed for it. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap for the small groups. So now you see, he went into lilies and he prayed. He sought God before he reacted. He acted according to God's word. So verse 4 says, look at him. Because he spent time with God, he had a clear vision about his wife. Because he separated himself to seek God, to find rest, he began to see her in a whole new perspective. He was, he was mad at her because he opened the door with the force. He's breaking the door. He had that emotion driving him. But after he spent time, after he departed into Lilith, now he calls her, you are beautiful. Can you believe that? He said, you are beautiful. My darling, as a Tirza, lovely as Jerusalem, Majestic as the troops with the banner. Now he had a, now he gained the perspective of who she is and what she is. And he goes on to say, but my dough, he even calls my honey bun, my dough, my perfect one. And I highlighted these two words, my perfect one. Can you believe that? He calls her a perfect. Just now she, she put him outside the door. Just now she yelled at him. And he calls her perfect one. What that means is he made a choice, my friend. He made a choice in his mind. Even though other people may look her, she's not perfect. But in his mind, she's perfect. My wife, I say always, you're perfect, sweetheart. She's like, <laughs> she says, no, sweetheart, I don't care what people, do. you're perfect to me. And look at, he said, he's un she's un unique. She said, you're unique. You're not, you're not like me. You know, wife and husband, they're not the same. And it's, it's important for us to know they're uniquely made according to what God is doing in their life. And it's important for us to accept that uniqueness. And he, see, he even says, you're unique, the only daughter of our mo her mother and a favorite one who 
who bore her. The maiden saw her and called her blessed. The reason the people call her blessed, because her husband sees her as a perfect. The reason other women looked at uh, your wife, man, she's great. It's not because she's acted that way, because her husband is talking about her. Man, my wife is awesome. My wife is great. My wife is unique. She can do better. She's awesome. She's a, she's a smart woman. He's the one confessing about us, his wife. So I want to encourage you, husbands, take that. Even though you know she has weaknesses, but walk by faith. Take that word. And you say, you're beautiful. In your mind, you make up your mind. It's a choice. It's not emotion. Your emotion may say, no, she's not. But you got to make a choice. No, she's beautiful. She's perfect. She's uniquely made by God. And God gave it to me. And she's mine. And we're united for the great purpose of God's glory. And you're speaking life. You're speaking life. And the world seeing, man, she's a blessed woman. My wife walked into somebody else's door, and she looked at him. She looked at her. She's like, you got the lottery. She looked at both of us. She said, like, man, she looked at me, and she looked at her. Like, she looked at that, my wife. She said, you got the lottery. And what that means is you're really blessed with this man. So people can see that the glory of your words on your wife. People can see what you speak highly of your wife. And he can, he can walk in it. It's important. You know, don't take me wrong. Me and my wife, we have fights. We go through some things. Sometimes I look at her and I say, I can't. You know, it's like we go through some little small things. Not the big things like when you want to put the bills together and do some things. And I said, you know, I can hate the fact she's not like me. Or I thank God she's not like me. Because you don't want to know who I am outside this pulpit. You know, because let me, let me tell you this. I know some of you are looking like, what are you saying? God gifted me the anointing to speak. When I get into the war with my wife, especially in, 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 in the wars, I win all the time. I'm not saying proudly. I'm saying guilty-wise. I hurt her many times with my words. Because the anointing that God gave me for to preach the gospel, but the enemy took that and manipulated and used that word to speak to my wife, and I was hurting her not knowingly. This was 25 years ago, though. Yeah, I was, I was using that word, and I had to grow. I had to understand, wait a minute, the gift that God gave me, not to abuse the people, but to bless the people, the gift of the anointing on my life to speak life, not a death, because God gave me the ability to speak. And I learned that. And that's what I said. You know, sometimes I think like, man, I, can't, I, I, I hate that my wife is not like me. But thank God she's not like me. So I would not win in that fight. Amen? So it's important for us to learn to use words like Solomon did so we can speak blessings. Number two, that in this, in this relationship that I found that out, that we can fight right is I will focus on good, not bad. It's important as a couple, once you get married, when you pass honeymoon season, when you pass the disillusionment season, when you come to close to commitment season, that's it's easy for you to focus on bad than good. We all go through that. We're all going to focus on bad than good. But it's important. A lot of times, the counsel, when I was talking to a couple, one couple, all I said, before you talk about that person, can you tell me 10 good things about the person? Guess what? The person could not go more than two. And I asked, how long you've been married? 15 years, something wrong with the marriage. So it's important. The most of, majority of times, the counsel they need is to remind them how good your spouse is. That's it. That's the only counsel we need. Sometimes we fight for the things that is so meaningless. And we lose, we lose uh, uh, you know, the focus on the person. So it's important for us to focus on good, not bad. And every time when you go through a conflict, try to remember good things that she did, good things that he did, good, good personalities that they have. Write it down. I used to write them down. My wife is this. My wife did. She's smart in this area. She, she'll do documentation. All these things I put it. Emotion will bend their knees before my God. 
choice will come alive. And I begin to see things, you know, in a different perspective. So Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything else is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We're naturally... We're natural to think evil all the time. We're natural to think bad all the time. We're natural to think weak all the time. We're natural to think, how come this doesn't work? How come this doesn't work? You know, so-and-so is not doing right. So-and-so is bad. So It's always like that. But look at Apostle Paul's counsel. He said, don't think about those things. Choose. Make a choice. You're going to make a choice to say, you know one thing? I'm going to think what is noble. I'm going to think what is right. I'm going to think what is pure. I'm going to think what is lovely. I'm going to think what is admirable. Admirable, anything that's excellent, think about such things. Jesus was on the cross, we all know, and they're literally crucifying him. A brutal punishment. The capital punishment, so brutal back there, you couldn't even fathom somebody bleeding on the cross, dying like that. But even in the middle of that pain, middle of that loss, the middle of that cry, the middle of that all that agony. Jesus said these words. He made a choice. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I want to remind you, my friend, if we are called Christians, I think it's time for us to follow Christ. If we call Christians, it's time for us to redo our marriage again, recommit our marriage again to God, and to lead our marriage according to His word. So if you look at next words, Psalms of Solomon 6, 11 to 13. And he says, I went down. Now he's speaking to her and the, and the friends. I went down to the grove of nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley. To see if the vines had budded or the pomegranates were or blossom. What that means is, now I will yield to a new godly thought. About my wife. Bible says his mercies are new every day. So when we are separated from the conflict. And do it according to God's way. Dealing the conflict of fighting the fight. God will give you a new perspective about your wife. You can fall in love with the person again. My wife said the, two weeks ago, I feel like I just fall in love again. I said, it's because we were in DR. No, she's not. It's not because we were in DR. It's because I just feel something new coming to me. Because she's seeing something new about me. God is revealing to her something new about me. God is revealing to me something new about her. So marriage can be blessed and blessed. And I can tell you something. Your marriage should be blessed this year more than the last year. Your marriage should be blessed next year more than this year. If we follow God's way, come on, let's give the Lord hands up. So I will yield to a new godly thought. Yield. Ask God. It's like a treasure box. My wife is a treasure box. It's my job to pull the treasures out. I am a treasure box. It's my wife's job to pull the treasures out. But if you do it right, you both become most powerful people on the planet Earth. If one can put 1,000 to fly, two can put 10,000 to fly. Can you believe what problem you cannot solve? Tell me. If you and your husband can get together, every business will work. If you and your husband to get together, every prayer must be answered. If you and your husband to get together, every cry the Lord has to answer. Because there's a power in that unity. There's an assignment of God in that unity. God will make every impossible possible for your family, for your children, for your people. Because you're united in the Lord's eye. He does it. I have a testimony. I'm just going to consolidate the testimony. We looked at almost... Eight plus buildings before we got this. None of the buildings were, were one. It was all me. Talked to a few people, my friends and then, uh, pastors. I went to this building, didn't work. That building didn't work. 
And I'm questioning God. God, I used all my faith. I gave all my tithes. I did everything, God. How come you're not giving a church building where I will, I will rest there, have a growth there so we can have a lot of things going on? None of them worked. I was frustrated. But one day, I did like Solomon did. I took a break from everybody, everything. Fasted. I said, God, I really need to know this. If I'm making any mistake, please tell me, God. I want to make it right. You know, I was seeking God. All of a sudden, early morning, I could hear this voice. He said, the only one thing important to you, Philip, is take care of your wife. And all, I thought I was taking care of her. I'm paying bills. I'm there for her. If she want to eat taco, I eat taco even though I don't like it sometimes. If she want to, if she want to discipline me too, and I don't want to discipline, but I have to agree with her. You know what she likes, I do. You know, I was, I thought I was doing all that, but deep in my heart, he was saying, "You're not one with her." And I didn't even know what that really means at that time. You're not one with her. Do you know? I asked God to teach me. As the Lord was teaching me in a daily basis how to be one with her, how to bring her into assignment that God is creating, how to see her what I'm seeing, this building manifested without a hard work, people. God opened this door. We didn't even sweat like we used to sweat with other buildings. Just we prayed. Me and her agreed together. We prayed. We did what God called us to do. We sowed into ministries where God called us to Bam, this opened the door. Can we give the Lord hand glove? He just did it. Me and my wife, we're still amazed what God did it. I'm serious. If you would have been in the previous building, I was thanking God. If you give me one bathroom more, I'd be so happy, Lord. I don't need a four or five. Just give me one more extra. I'm going to be so happy. He said, no, let me tell you something, Philip. I'm not going to give you one. I'm going to give you 20. So he gave all the bathrooms that we can go have a service in it. But it begins with my marriage. So I want to encourage you here that you seek godly counsel. And I will yield every day. I will yield for a new thought about my wife. I will ask God, give me something new about her, God. I want to meditate. I want to meditate. That I want to keep that. He goes on to say in next scripture, I'm done here. Before I realized it, my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. In other words, because he chose to do, allow a God's new thought, his mind is set towards her. His mind was prepared that this is the woman my life will continue and live. This is the woman that I'm going to continuously go. And look at what the world says. The world says, come back, come back, O Shulamite. Come back, come back, that we may gaze on you. The world are celebrating on that woman because of the choices that they made. They didn't focus on winning, but they focus on Resolving the conflict. You, you know, can I tell you, uh, people of God, you know, never try to win in the fight. It's not worth it. Because we try to win in the fight, but it's not worth it. Never try to win. But the goal is not to win. The goal is to resolve. And we got to learn how to resolve than winning. Because you can win. I can win with my words. I can make my wife make her feel like she's going to be by herself in the room. I can do that. But that is not the winning. The thing is when I bring resolution. That's what God wants us to do. When you're in conflict, when you try to win, you will lose relationship. It's important for us to know you can win, but at the same time you're, you're damaging relationship. You're going to lose that relationship. And that wife or a husband will, will check them ourselves out and they'll be doing things that you don't even believe they'd be doing. They check out from your relationship. They're watching Facebook. They get into something they're not supposed to be getting in. Because of the conflict we did not handle right, they check out. But it's important for us to do how God says. In the last verse, he says, why would you gaze on the Shulamite? You know, the Shulamite word is first time you can see in this chapter. 
And I was looking at what in the world is Shulamite. Shulamite means the people that love shoes. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, no so Shulamite, Shulamite means it's a woman of Jerusalem. In other words, he gave her a name of his own. He gave her his internal name to her. He calls her a name that nobody called her. He created a name for her. This word is, uh, comes in this entire Bible first time here. And Solomon used this word for his wife. Because he saw something about her. No man saw her. And he calls her Shulamite. And he says, you know, uh, why would you gaze on the Shulamite? As, the, uh, as on the dance of uh, Mahanaim. Mahanaim is kind of a celebration. It's a mount, mountain in Jerusalem. It's kind of, that's where they do celebration. In other words, that the world begin to celebrate about that couple who fought right. The couple who choose to fight godly way than the emotional way. So I want you to know that God is calling all of us to take a step, these three steps, during the conflict, like that woman, instead of she's focusing on bad, she's focusing on who he is, how handsome he is, how good he is, how brilliant he is. And same thing he did. Instead of focusing on her weaknesses, why she closed the door, why she did not let me in, he started thinking about her. My, my wife is beautiful. My wife is perfect. My wife is per was uniquely made by God. He chose he choose to do that. And I encourage you. I know some of you are probably looking like, Pastor, that's too hard for me to do it. I can't do that. I wish I could do that. I can't do that. Let me help you. That I maybe give you some more scriptures to understand. Give you that understanding. In Ephesians 4.26 says, He says here, He gives us this counsel. In your anger, do not sin. And do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. God is telling, this is a, this is, I call a godly instruction or counsel. Do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, my friend, if we don't do as God tells us to do, we're opening the door for the devil to come in the marriage. How many would like to have a devil in the marriage? No, you don't. You want God to come in in the marriage. So I'd rather be a wise man, invite God. So that's what I want to encourage you. If you don't know how to do it, ask God, God, help me to see my wife as pretty, as perfect, as unique. And God will give you that. Help me, Lord, that I can see my husband handsome and wonderful, a man of respect. And God will give you that. He'll give you that. And you will celebrate your marriage more and more. It's a great privilege for me to bring this message series to educate all of us. We all need to grow. Because I don't want to invite devil in my life. No, I don't. Neither do you. You don't want that. Do not let the sun go down. I try all the time. When, in, in, when we're in conflict, I try to go reconcile before the sun goes down. Because we don't want to lay down. Have you ever find, find out, you know, some of us, you know, you go to a bed with a fighting attitude and you feel, you wake up heavy head. You like you feel like a bad dreams and all that. It's because somebody has entered into your family trying to bring the torture. You know, it's important for us to really walk in it. In other scriptures that I want to encourage you, if you don't know why we should do, 1 John 4, 8 and 11, it says, whoever does not love does not know God. It's important for us to love one another. Bible tells us, if I don't love you, if I don't love anybody, he says that I don't know God. Because God is love, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And he goes on to say, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also are to love one another. He loved us first. I encourage you to choose God's way to love your spouse. I encourage you to choose God's way to love your husband. I encourage you to choose God's way to love your employer, employee. 
And there are so many blessings that's going to follow with those choices. So much contentment that's going to follow with those choices. So much joy is going to follow with those choices. So it's a commitment. We're going to make that commitment today. And if you can just bow your head, you that are watching, I want to thank you for tuning in. If you just can bow your heads today. I gave you those three phases of relationships and the three ways how they fought as a couple. Instead of looking, instead of acting, instead of reacting, they acted right. Instead of focusing on bad, they choose to focus on good. And instead of living in the yesterday's revelation, they ask God to reveal something new about their spouse. My friend, if you're ready to recommit your life to God again, if you're ready to recommit your marriage to God again, if you're ready that, you know, Lord, yes, I made a mistake. Yes, we all made a mistake. But Jesus has taken care yesterday. He's given us a brand new slate for us to make a godly choices. My friend, you make a choice and the feeling will follow the choice. Let's make a choice today. Let's make a choice that we're going to love our spouse as God is teaching us. We're going to look at them. They're perfect for you, at least for you alone. And they're unique for you. Don't try to run away from your spouse. Bring your marriage before God. Invite him into your marriage. You say, God, come into my marriage. Teach me, God. If you can raise the dead, I believe that you will raise my marriage back again. I invite you, my friend, to recommit your marriage to God so that you can fight right starting today. Starting today, you can do right. You can do right. Next two weeks, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to teach you how to be committed to your spouse according to God's standard. It's going to be a blessing. But today, I want you, I would like for you to, to make some decision today. This is a moment of commitment time. Moment of decision. Heaven is looking up to us. Heaven is gazing to us to see what we could do right now. This is the moment that I want to pass the cup of salvation. A cup that you can drink and invite God into your marriage. Invite God into your life. I would like to pray for three things. If you're ready to act, not to react. I would like to pray for you the power of God so that you can act. And I would like to pray that when you're ready to recommit your marriage, I want to pray that God will remind you good things, not the bad things. And I would like to pray a prayer of commitment for you. If you're ready to commit your marriage, you're ready to invite God into your life, into your marriage, in your children's life. Can I see your hand so that I can pray for you? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Anybody else before... We're going to pray for, thank you, there's right there, thank you, thank you, ma'am, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you can, you can put those hands down. And, then, and then don't worry who's next to you. And I want you to talk to God and just say, Lord, I, I surrender my marriage to you, God. You that husbands, just declare that, Lord, I surrender my marriage to you. Here I am, I surrender my wife to you. Teach me. How to be a husband like you are. Mold me how to be a husband like you are. Teach me, God. Come into my life, Lord. Make me a brand new husband, Lord. Yes, I thought I was a man. I thought I knew how to be a husband. But I failed over and over again. I went through divorce. I failed over again. Now I invite you, God. Teach me. So that I can follow your instructions and be like that man to stand by her faithfully like you do for your bar bride. Here I am. Invite you, God. Invite you, God. Just invite. Invite. Just surrender that marriage to him. He said, Lord, my marriage belongs to you. Teach me, God. And God is about to do something awesome, my friend. I, 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 I bel I'm believing this church is going to be walking in marriage blessings. I'm believing. I'm believing with all my heart. God is going to do something awesome in this church through marriages. God is going to raise up a couple that are godly in this house. They're going to be, they're going to be moral 
in this, in this world, the people are going to look at them and say, how did you do that? And you're going to say, because God is with me. Because God is in me. You're going to say that. When you're ready, I want you to just pray after me. And then I'm going to pray globally for all of us. Say out loud, Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for revealing the truth about my marriage, about my life. And I invite you, Lord, to come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive all my sins. Give me a brand new life. I thank you, Lord, for accepting me as your own children, as is your own son and daughter. Lead me in truth and righteousness. I trust in you. I invite you into my family in our marriages right now in Jesus name amen amen if you pray that prayer I want you to just just quiet I'm gonna I'm gonna pray over you father I lift up CJC life every marriage God we rededicate these marriages to you God we cannot do on this world of corruption we cannot do on this world of pollution we cannot do Lord we invite your power to enable us to do as Solomon did it. We invite your power to enable us to do as Solomon's wife did it. We thank you, Lord, for touching every marriage in this room and canceling every assignment of evil and breaking the backbone of the culture and reviving your people's marriage and blessing your people's marriage. I thank you for your blessing upon every single couple in this room and the people that are about to get married. We speak blessings in Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody give the Lord a big hand? Come on, bless his name. If you can, bless his name. Amen. 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 I, I, I feel his grace in this room for marriages. I just feel it. I just feel that grace. He's going to do a grand, a grand new thing in you. It's going to be so grand. But you're going to, you're going to write in a book. You're going to write somebody, somebody's marriage is going to blossom in a way that you're, you're going to apply God's principle. God is going to bless you beyond you can imagine. You even sitting here, you say, I don't want to have a marriage like my mom. God said he's, he's, he's hearing that. He's going to do that. You, you're here sitting there, I don't want to have a marriage like my brothers, my sister. I want to have a good marriage. I want to have a marriage that is meaningful to me, to my wife. I want to have a marriage that is going to be a celebration to many people. God said, I'm going to give that to you. He's going to do that. He's going to, he's going to give a new set of principles to lead your marriage as, as a testimony to many people. It's a testimony to many people. Amen. Amen. Did you receive that? Amen. Let's give the Lord one more time if we can. Give the Lord thank you. CJC Life would like to invite you to our Easter Sunday services on April 5th. A dynamic, heartfelt message for all those who are in need of Christ the Savior. We are encouraging you to invite all your friends, your family, to hear the amazing, miraculous gospel message of Jesus Christ and His unfailing love for all of humanity. 